This week we covered principal component analysis, which is essentially a linear method for dimensionality reduction. In this video we're going to take a look at nonlinear alternatives that effectively lead to the recovery of nonlinear principal components. So why do we want to consider nonlinear methods? Uh, well, of course, simply because they are more powerful, right? Uh, because, for example, consider this example. Uh, we have this distribution of data points, and it seems to be clearly concentrated around this one-dimensional uh, structure. So if we want to reduce our data points to a single number, we want to essentially project it onto this, this uh, line indicated in red, right? Now, obviously, this cannot be done with uh, linear principal component analysis, right? Because it just looks for the largest directional variation and maybe it's something like this. So you would have the, this linear model where each point is mapped on this uh, particular line and it's no longer really representative of my original data points. So this is something that you may get out of uh, linear uh, PCA. But ideally we want to recover this uh, representation, right? So um, now the question is really, can we do this with nonlinear PCA then? And the answer is yes, there are indeed several approaches that would be able to recover this, this lower dimensional uh, structure indicated over here. And uh, we're going to cover um, some of them in this video. So maybe the first sensible thing that you could do is maybe try to turn this into a linear problem. So suppose this is my data set, so it follows this, let's say, one dimensional uh, parameterization of my data. Uh, there's noise around it and we want to recover this uh, particular line. Now what you could do, of course, is to maybe work with, with basis functions. So we, you turn this into a new feature representation. Um, so let me write this out so we can use... So we can use predefined feature vectors to map my each, each data point uh, to a new point in this, in this new space, right? And if I'm clever, I, I pick my uh, basis functions in such a way that this is sort of unwrapped into this uh, linear uh, thing. And then we can do principal component analysis in this space where, and well, of course, nice, now there is one clear principal direction. And so we can nicely recover this one dimensional uh, structure in this new uh, feature space. If we project it back, we maybe get something out, something like this. So using these basis methods, we are in principle uh, able to recover such a lower dimensional uh, manifold structure. But of course, this is super complicated because how am I going to choose my basis functions? To be honest, I cannot imagine which type of basis function to pick here or which type of feature factors to pick here that turns this into a linear problem. But in principle, this is possible, right? But the challenge remains how to choose uh, your basis functions. And of course, one way to go about this is to learn your basis functions again via neural networks. And that's something that I'm going to show in one of the, the next slides. But first, let's stick with this idea of working with these feature vectors, which is uh, phi's of x. So the approach that I just, just described was essentially trying to linearize the data, right? By making a particular choice for my feature vectors that would turn this complicated point cloud into something which is a more uh, linear structure uh, to it. And then once you do it, you can do principal component analysis in this uh, space, into this feature space. And that would give you a principal component uh, like this, for example. And recall that principal component analysis re relies on this eigen uh, decomposition of my covariance matrix. So in the original space, it looks like this. And in my feature space, this would be the covariance uh, matrix. Of course, assuming that the average over all my data points of these feature vectors is zero, right? Because in general, uh, the sample covariance of such a random variable is given in the following form where we still have to take these averages as, into account. But for now, let's assume uh, the, the average feature value over all my data points is zero. And then we get this expression for the covariance matrix. Okay, so in principle, we could do something like this. We do PCA on this covariance matrix, and that would give me this principal component, and we can find ways to map it back to my uh, original space. Now, it turns out that similar to the linear regression case, uh, where we did linear regression with basis functions, uh, also now the solutions, which are the principal components, uh, can be expressed entirely in terms of the original data points via the definition of a kernel. So if we define this uh, kernel to be this uh, product of these uh, feature vectors, then of course we can still just proceed as we have been doing so far. We compute the eigenvectors of uh, this covariance matrix U1 and the, the i-th component is then simply given by uh, the projection of my feature vector onto this uh, component. But now it turns out that uh, these projections can also be obtained directly from my kernel. So 
um, I can do so by uh, computing the eigenvectors of this uh, kernel matrix. And that would give me these uh, principal components in, in the kernel space. And then using these components, we can compute uh, the projected values uh, simply by summing over all my data points, the, the values within my uh, vector uh, with the corresponding uh, kernel values. So I realize I'm skipping some details here, but the, the main point is that instead of working with the principal components of C, which is really explicitly defined in such uh, basis functions. So what I'm doing there, I compute this covariance matrix, uh, which is now M by M dimensional, right? Because each um, feature vector was of length M. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to compute the eigenvectors of this N by N matrix, which essentially encodes for all similarities between one data point to the other. And then once we have obtained the i eigenvector, and this particular eigenvector is of length n, then I can show that uh, the projected uh, component, so this component value, so this is really the same as this, and I can show that I can also obtain this component purely in, in terms of my original data point xn using this eigenvector uh, a just omtaid and using uh, the definition of my kernel. Now, the reason I'm doing this is uh, because now we can apply the kernel trick. So we can essentially just define this, uh, replace this kernel with any uh, valid kernel. And that's going to be the topic of next week to, to see what kind of kernels we can choose. But essentially the, the idea is that this kernel corresponds to some choice of basis. And now I'm not explicitly choosing my basis, but I'm just formulating a particular kernel. I make a choice for a kernel. And I'm doing that because now this kernel could implicitly represent uh, feature vectors that are of infinite dimension. And this makes it a very uh, powerful technique because you can imagine if you, uh, let's say, choose M uh, basis functions, let M go to infinity. So you consider all sorts of basis functions, then there is probably maybe some direction which really describes my main direction of variation in a, a reliable way. So that's essentially the main idea behind this uh, kernel trick and we will cover it uh, in much more detail in, in the next week. But essentially it describes a very powerful method. Let me write it down. So this is a very powerful method because this allows me to implicitly work with infinite dimensional feature vectors, which really implies that my M can be infinite but I do not have to explicitly compute all these feature values because that's encoded in these kernel functions. Okay, but that essentially covers uh, kernel uh, PCA in a very summarized form. And for more details, you can check out uh, chapter 12.3 in the book of Bishop. But for now, it's sufficient to know that, uh, well, of course, we can choose to work with basis functions. And when we do, do that, we decide to work with basis functions, then we can also decide to work with kernel functions instead. And instead of explicitly defining my kernels, uh, uh, sorry, my basis functions, I can also just define some kernel, which maybe implicitly represents a, a particular basis. Okay, now then this is an example of, of kernel PCA. So this is a highly symmetric data set of two concentric circles. Uh, so we can clearly see two, two separate classes, uh, call it in, in red and blue, though uh, the data, the algorithm itself doesn't see these classes, right? It just observes this uh, point clouds. Then if I apply principal component analysis to this, I'm trying to look at the directions of main variation and whatever direction I look at is going to be exactly the same, right? So uh, this is actually the result. If I project my data points X to my principal components, I'm just, I'm doing nothing. I'm really, I'm just rotating actually. Uh, look at this point, it's now rotated to this, but apart from that, um, the data set is exactly the same. So with principal component analysis, I do not really gain new insight in, in my data. So now I said we can work uh, with kernel PCA. So I can define this uh, radial basis function, uh, which we're going to cover uh, next week. Uh, but the idea is this uh, kernel really is some sort of measure of similarity or closeness uh, to, to all the points. And this intrinsically describes an infinite dimensional uh, Gaussian basis, uh, essentially. Then the interesting thing is if we use a uh, kernel PCA with uh, such kernel functions, we actually are nicely able to separate our data. So what you see on the horizontal axis is uh, my first uh, principal component. So, e so the, the Z1 value of each data point. And on the vertical axis, we have the Z2 values. 
And these values are now obtained via highly nonlinear functions. And that's actually indicated over here with these level sets. So these level sets indicate the corresponding Z1 values. So these level sets indicate the value for Z1 as a function of, of X. So on this side, it assigns, uh, let's say, positive values. And then on this side, it assigns negative values. Z1 is uh, positive. On this side, we have in green, we have Z1 is negative. And these white regions correspond really to a Z1 is uh, zero. So we see that this uh, first principal component really pulls apart this, this blue point cloud, right? Because points on the left uh, are assigned a negative value, points on the right are assigned this uh, positive value. And it doesn't do really do anything with uh, the red uh, points. They're all mapped to some low value close, uh, close to zero. So that's what you see over here. And then this kernel PCA also learned this uh, Z2 component, which isn't plotted over here, but we see that it sort of uh, disentangles the data based on the distance of a point to the origin. So all these red points, they get some negative value and then the blue points get some positive value. So we have some isotropic uh, function mapping over here, but which is still uh, super nonlinear. So the main point of this slide is that if you use linear PCA, you now it's illustrated in 2D. So you have these um, principal components that really are based on a particular direction. So uh, the component value linearly increases if you move along uh, one particular direction and then the second component increases in this direction. So um, in this 2D space, really nothing happens. And these principal directions, they, they can be scaled, of course. Uh, but in this particular case, where there's no clear uh, direction of main variation, really nothing happens to my data. And then if we work with kernel functions, uh, we are able to recover highly nonlinear mappings from uh, a point X to its uh, principal component value. And this may be a bit abstract for now, but we will look into more detail into such uh, kernel methods uh, in the next week. Okay, so for now, let's move on to a different way for uh, dimensionality reduction. Now we can also do this via neural networks. And these type of neural networks are typically, typically called autoencoders or auto-associative neural networks. And the idea is actually, well, similar as before. So we have our input X and we want to map it to some latent variable, to this lower dimensional representation of X. And we call the neural network that does this, we call it the encoder. So that is essentially uh, this part of the neural network that takes an input and maps it to uh, some latent variable. Uh, we can make this uh, part of the neural network very deep, which results in a very complicated mapping of X to my latent variable. Uh, and then we are also working with a decoder. And this decoder reconstructs uh, my uh, original data from these latent representations. So it turns this lower dimensional vector into my original higher dimensional uh, point via this, um, well, generator or decoder. And again, this decoder can be a very complex uh, neural network. And typically you try uh, to match, uh, to make this design somewhat uh, symmetric. Okay, and then with such a design in place, so we have an input which is mapped to some latent variable and this latent variable can then be reconstructed. And now the goal is of course that uh, these uh, reconstructed data points, they should be similar to my original data points. So similar to the uh, minimal reconstruction error formulation of principal component analysis, we're now also going to uh, optimize my neural network weights as to minimize uh, this uh, reconstruction error. Okay, so that looks something like this, right? So we have uh, our original data point and we have our reconstructed data point and we want to minimize this error. And we're uh, optimizing this with respect to the model parameters of my uh, neural networks, right? So each of these function mappings is parameterized by a neural network, which con is, consists of all these weights, same for the generator or the decoder. Um, so this is what's happening, right? So FW, which takes as input is X, maps uh, spits out this, this latent uh, variable uh, set. And this is in turn used by uh, the decoder uh, to turn this into a uh, reconstructed data point. And because these functions, they can be deep, they can be very abstract neural networks. So these function mappings are highly nonlinear. And so there's also, you cannot expect to find a closed form solution to, to this problem. So what people typically do, they, they solve this via stochastic gradient descent or whatever optimization method, which is nowadays popular to optimize uh, neural networks. And currently still it's stochastic gradient descent or any variation of this. And uh, now, 
We already identified the similarity with a uh, principal component analysis from this minimal reconstruction point of view. So we can actually formulate this PCA or this sort of architecture also in the form of a, of a neural network. So we have here a uh, um, mapping from X to Z. And in my principal component analysis, this F was really a linear mapping, right? It was given uh, by the following. So we subtract uh, the mean of my data points, and then we project it to this latent variable. So this is really a linear projection and we can think of it as let's say the first weights in my, uh, the, the weights in my first layer and this is uh, the bias in my uh, first layer and in the reconstruction part we consider these sets to be the the, the basis coefficients um, corresponding to this particular basis so this can then be thought of as uh, the weights in my second layer that maps my uh, latent variable to the original data point and it also has this uh, bias so this shows that for a particular choice of my uh, neural networks uh, weights uh, namely these principal components, I actually recover principal component analysis. So principal component analysis can be thought of as a two-layer autoencoder uh, without any activation functions. It's completely linear. Okay, but now in this autoencoder uh, viewpoint, uh, we relax this constraint that it has to be linear and we can choose very complicated uh, functions f and g. And then as before, so we can uh, reconstruct original data points via these models. And again, when working with images, for example, we can assess the quality, right? As we also have done in the PCA reconstruction case, this was my original image and I can reconstruct it for different uh, models, for different settings of the principal components. Similar thing you can do now also in this deep learning uh, setting. But actually as a bonus, and this is really interesting and it's a popular line of research, uh, in the deep learning landscape at the moment, is that we can also use this generator part or this, this decoder part to generate uh, fake data, right? So what I could do, I could just pick some uh, latent variable set and then pass it through my generated and it spits out some reconstructed image and you, you can check how realistic this thing is. Now it turns out that we can design such a, uh, such autoencoders in a probabilistic setting where we really take on the interpretation that my latent variable actually comes from some uh, probability distribution. So my encoder really maps my input X to some latent variable Z, which has some place in this uh, probability, in this latent uh, distribution. Um, let's say it came from some distribution P of Z. And then you can design your optimization frame framework in this probabilistic setting that in the generator phase, we can randomly sample a, a point Z from this distribution to generate a new data point. Okay, if, if you want to learn more to this uh, probabilistic, so variational autoencoder setting, I can really recommend looking at this paper, Variational Autoencoders by Kigma and, and Welling. But the main point is then that once we have sampled such a set, we can generate a fake image. And that's indicated over here. So I have this set of images, uh, one like either on the left or the right, I really don't know. Uh, one of these sets of images is real and the other is generated via such uh, autoencoder. And to be honest, I can't remember anymore which is real and which is not. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this is fake because we have these weird artifacts going on over there. Um, but then if I look at this image, I have this figure over here, which I cannot really assign to any digit. Um, so this is really interesting. So with such an autoencoder, you can generate images, you can generate digits, which are never written by any human before. It's just completely generated via this um, neural network. And then of course you can push this a bit further and actually generate uh, natural images, like images, let's say these, these portrait uh, photos. And this is a really popular line of deep learning research to generate data as realistically as possible. And what you see is a result from a variational autoencoder type of neural networks, but actually the, the, the deep fakes that you typically see out on the internet are not necessarily of a VAE type, a bit more like generative adversarial networks or whatever other network uh, that currently runs the state of the art, but with VAEs you can actually get can get pretty far. So obviously there's there's quite some artifacts uh, going on in, in these type of images, but the idea is that all these images they are randomly generated. So uh, they came from a latent space, a low dimensional latent space. So I pick one of such factors a Z and plug this into my generator, and that constructed these type of Im images. And that actually allows for all sorts of things. For example, we can interpolate between images. Uh, so you can do this experiment that you have an image of a young person and an old person, and then you can sort of regress how this person would change over time to match the, this face, this old face, for example. 
and people are trying to put a lot of effort in trying to disentangle different features. So if if you were to see a face of, of me and you want to know what I would look like as a girl, then you can sort of uh, move this uh, latent variable in, in this space and, and move it to the, the female side, uh, let's say. And so that sort of brings us back to the very first video on this principal component analysis that we want to recover this latent structure that explains all the variations in my data. If I look at images of people, then I don't know, some people have bushy eyebrows, some people don't, some people uh, are female, so, some people are, are not. And uh, so there's all these variations and all these latent variables that sort of tell me what the picture would look like in the end. And in the first video, I considered this case with, with the, the MS digit tree, which was translated and wrote it, but, but it goes way beyond that. Okay, so these kind of experiments are really fun and popular, but maybe at first sight, they are at the same time also not particularly meaningful. Uh, on, on the contrary, uh, the generation of deep fakes imposes some very real ethical problems. So whenever you work on such topics, I really want you to think hard about why you should want to do these type of experiments uh, in the first place and, and what value does, they, does it have. Um, for example, such images are nice because we can interpret them and it actually led to the discovery of very elegant dimensionality reduction methods that are now used uh, for example, to also explore the space of, let's say, molecules for drug designs, right? Because we can, in principle, also uh, learn a network to generate molecules that can have uh, particular properties that can help with curing diseases, for example. But at the same time, we also see that such technology is, is used for deep fakes in, let's say, way less noble applications. All right, but I don't have time to give an extra course on ethics in AI, but I really want you to be aware that this is actually a very important and big topic uh, in itself. Okay, that's all I have to say about it now. Uh, that really ends this uh, video series on dimensionality reduction via latent variable models.